Abhishekha Kinta, I'm a project director in the Center for Opportunities and Outcomes at Teachers College Columbia University. In the last two years, I've been involved in uh, research involving social problem solving, bullying issues for young children and adolescents with autism. So when Jennifer and Ruth began to plan this initiative, I jumped in and I said, you know, I would help them um, be part of this uh, organization. Uh, tonight is the second event in a series of events that have been planned here at the College of New Rochelle as part of the Autism Education Week. Many of you who were here last night will appreciate that the coming together of the multiple perspectives brought by the panelists on the issues of identification and advocacy presented a very passionate and dynamic dialogue of values, roles, and responsibilities that we often see in the discussions on autism. Lydia Brown, provided an empowering view of advocacy from the perspective of an autistic disability activist. And citing real examples from her life, she clearly attributed that the problems and challenges in her life were not to do with the disability, but with the perceptions of society that she felt had constantly jeopardized her, and also because of the limited representation of what she called the autistic voice in public policy and advocacy efforts. I may not be an expert in autism, but I am an expert in knowing who my son is and what he needs, are the words of Lisa Quinones Fontenis. As a parent, she shared her story of how she learned to navigate the system to secure the most optimal resources and opportunities for her child. Lisa advocated for parents to be more involved, to be more informed and connected, and she especially supported the use of media sources and social networking. Marjorie St. Hilaire, a school psychologist with many years of experience working with students with autism, reminded us of the challenges of addressing the diverse needs on the spectrum, and she clearly advocated that we must listen to the preferences and choices of the students if we are to communicate better with them. Finally, we heard the views of Eddie Barash, who is the chair on the Committee on Preschool Special Education here in New Rochelle, and she represented the unified voice of many stakeholders she represented herself as a parent, an administrator, educational leader, and most importantly, that of a strong adequate perceptor, the Special Education Parent Teacher Association. In tracing the evolution in our understandings and acceptance of disability of autism and our practices in providing better supports and services in the school and community, Eddie, I think, brought it all together for us for what now special education stands child-centered uh, curriculum, individualized education planning, focus on RTI, differentiated practices, and finally the strong need for uh, combined parent professional advocacy. It is not necessary that we have to agree to one view or the other held by the different stakeholders as long as we have a common goal. I think that goal is quite clear more so after last night, that we all need to continue to understand the nature of autism, especially from the perspective of the individual themselves and to continue to support and empower individuals and families through greater support, effective services and resources, and more information sharing. We left off last night concluding that we all need to inform and educate ourselves for the effective care of individuals with autism. It is in the spirit of that goal that we are thrilled to present a different perspective to with you tonight, that of the scientific and medical field, with the hope of illuminating new practices that have been found to be truly effective and useful by teachers and parents. Addressing the medical and educational needs of individuals with autism often involve a number of hard choices. There are a variety of topics that, about autism that have consistently evoked a lot of thought and discussion with strong and varied views, such as the causes and cure of autism, the appropriateness of using medications, dietary interventions, and different cognitive and behavioral approaches. There are many misconceptions and myths about autism that make caregiving and education of this group an immensely emotional and challenging task. As Dr. Jennifer Scuro mentioned in her opening remarks yesterday, we all want what is best for the child and family, and we want to minimize the stress and confusion in the caregiving experience of a family with a child with autism. We are hoping to achieve that tonight by listening to research-based scientifically proven information about the truths of autism brought to us by our guest speaker, Dr. Ram Khairam. Dr. Ram Khairam is a pediatric neurologist at the Columbia University Medical Center in New York City with more than 40 years of experience in the fields of pediatrics, neurology, program, 
Development and Medical Administration, Dr. Kairam, has dedicated his tireless efforts to providing multi-dimensional support for individuals on the autism spectrum and their families. Dr. Kairam exemplifies a pediatric neurologist who is equal parts doctor, teacher, social worker, and family advocate. In 2002, he founded the Autism Treatment and Advocacy Center at the Bronx Devonian Hospital to address the need for early identification and treatment of autism spectrum disorders in South Bronx, a medically underserved and social economically disadvantaged community. Dr. Kairam's emphasis has been on parental education and empowerment, combining clinic and classroom in a way that puts parents at the forefront of their child's care. Dr. Kairam, with the support of a developmental pediatrician, two pediatric neurologists, a legal advocate and social worker, hosts a support group for parents of children with autism spectrum, on the autism spectrum disorder. Dr. Kairam wishes to engage in educating both the medical profession and parents in understanding the truths about autism so that we can collectively provide the most comprehensive quality care to the individuals. For more information about Dr. Kairam's work, you can go to autismtruths.org. Uh, tonight, Dr. Kairam will be speaking on the topic Autism Myths and Truths, Classification, Treatment, and Education. In order to maximize our learnings from Dr. Kairam, I really would encourage you to ask him questions. He's best known for a very open, interactive format of presentation. So he would welcome questions. Um, and I really do welcome you, Dr. Kairam. Thank you very much. At this point, you're all supposed to say, how on earth could he have been practicing for 40 years? He looks so good. <laughs> <laughs> Hello to my wife and Mrs. Terry. We live in Russia. And uh, I am not an autism researcher. I'm not a biochemical geneticist. I'm not a neurobiologist. I'm a practicing doctor, a pediatric neurologist. Uh, who spent about 17 years in the Bronx, and five months ago, I moved back into Manhattan into Columbia University of Manhattan. In these last several years in the Bronx, I had an opportunity and also the resources to develop an autism clinic. The man, they came out of the woodwork. It's like the Kevin Costner movie, if you build a pump, mm -hmm. and I will show you what happened. So what I want to do today is I want to um, put everything that I have learned in a manner in which you can take home some information, many of, much of which, much of what you might have already heard, but I will tell you my way. So I put it in terms of the 10 most important questions in autism, and don't worry, these lights are two years old, they haven't changed a whole lot, but I'll tell you a little bit. The 10 most important questions. Is incidence rising? This is a school. So there must be people who do research, occasionally an epidemiologist coming to give a talk, some statisticians, etc. So is the incidence rising? How many of you raise hand think the incidence of autism is rising? All right, we've got an interesting evening coming up. <laughs> is it a genetic disorder? How many people think it is not a genetic disorder? Not a genetic disorder. Well, I'll keep you engaged. Do vaccines or mercury cause autism? Don't raise hands. All educated people, you should know this. What is the developmental biology? What actually happens in the brain for a child to behave like an autistic individual? What is the neuropathology? Much of neurology science is developed from pathology. And when an autistic child dies and you examine the brain, what do you find? What are the comorbidities? What are the other things that go wrong with an autistic child that make him ill and be a problem and occupy a lot of family's time and the medical resources? How do we treat this disorder? Is there a cure? 
How many people in this room think there is a cure for autism? There are people on the internet selling cures. There are people on the internet using the words, my child was recovered from autism. Look at the words. Planning for transition to adulthood. On May 19th, we are running a huge conference on age 17 to 21. How do you prepare an autistic child to be an adult? Mm -hmm. Because when a child turns 21, something extraordinary happens. Anybody wants to guess what it is? No more school bus. <laughs> no more bus taking him away for all day. She's stuck with him. You notice know I said she? I'm talking about low functioning autistic children who are stuck with mother, grandmother, maternal aunt because all the men have run away. At least in my population. What is due for 2010-2011, that's an old slide, but as of June 1st, next month, something extraordinary will happen in the field of autism from the standpoint of professionals. So is incidence rising? This is the um, numbers of autistic children counted in a large database in California. You know, California is one of the largest states in America. It's a big country by itself. It breaks off, it can run by itself, right? Mm -hmm. 47 million people. All the children that go to public school in California are in one database. And something extraordinary happened in 1994. IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act 1994. It became law you have to educate a disabled child. So if you have to educate, you have to bring him in, bus him, bring him to a class that is suitable, and give him therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and educational intervention. Now how do you do that? The school board has to pay for it. Who do they charge it to? Home. Sacramento, right? So you have to count. So suddenly, there is a dramatic explosion of the number of children being labeled, classified, identified, cataloged, counted as autism, because there was need to give the service, collect the money, and pay the therapist. So around this time, there was a lot of debate. What's going on? Where did all these autism children come from? Are those children previously regarded as mentally retarded now being called autistic? Now what's going on in California? The incidence of epilepsy did not go up. CP is the same. Mental retardation, you know, staying with the population, but autism took off. In 2010, just for fun, we did this. I just added it. Why? In, from 2003 to 2010, the CDC began to count autism throughout the country. And then they said, one in 250 children have autism. One in 150, one in 110. Anybody wants to tell me what is the latest number from the CDC? One in 88. If that's true, it's going up like that. What could this be? Is it an infectious disease? No. Is it a genetic disorder? Keep thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Because if it's a genetic disorder, genetic disorders don't change in one lifetime. <laughs> they need two, three, four generations to go off. So keep thinking about this slide. So this is what the textbooks used to say, 1966. 4.4 out of 10,000. We are now up to 1 in 88. How could any disease go up in that dramatic increase in incidence if it is due to an outside agent. So in Bronx, Lebanon, in the poorest part of the South Bronx, Congressman Jose Sagano Jr. gave me a million dollar grant. So I created an autism center, and the number of autism visits began to go up. Mm -hmm. And then I messed up. Are you aware of the mental health parity law? 
You should know that. Because for every $10 that come down from Albany, $9 are for physical health, medical. $1 is for mental health. But anything you do with the child, diagnosis, testing, therapy, counseling, is called behavioral health. Like an idiot, I set up an autism center in a medical facility. I lost all million dollars, never made it out. Because you could not bill for mental health, behavioral health services in a physical medicine building. Mm -hmm. So the managers were upset with me. <laughs> so I moved all, everybody to a psychiatry clinic on Webster Avenue. Within four months, everybody quit. They said they didn't come to work for psychiatry, they came to work for me. So I lost the shop. I didn't give up. So I stayed with it because I was the department head. So I built it up, put additional staff, and look what happened. If you are willing to see the children, make diagnosis, help them, discuss the comorbidities, take care of the epilepsy, take care of the sleep problem, they will come. But the most important thing was Spanish translation and parent support them. If you did that, it happened. Now, what do you think happened with this extraordinary increase? First of all, the first thing that happened was DSM, Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. Once they created a diagnostic criteria for autism, then they came up with autistic spectrum disorder, then there were diagnostic criteria, and then there was financial need to diagnose properly, label, count, catalog, and bill for it. So I want to tell you that in my judgment, there is an epidemic of counting autism, <laughs> cataloging autism, accounting for autism, paying for autism, rather than an epidemic of autism. Epidemics don't behave like that. But it's very dramatic what has happened because they have all come into clinics and come into a lot of public discussion. In the last seven or eight years, there's an extraordinary increase in funding and all the serious, important, high quality labs that have been studying Alzheimer's disease for the last 20 years, breast cancer for the last 40 years, MS for the last 35 years, never made any progress. Now they want to get on to the autism thing because there is funding. Millions and millions of dollars have come into autism. <coughs> now, today I saw a child, five and a half year old, measured IQ of around 135. He's fully toilet trained. Upon going to school, he asked to have diaper put on. He will not use the toilet in the school. He will come home and he has stool in his toilet. But for that evening, that night, and Saturday and Sunday, he does not need pamper. What's up with him? He is the most extraordinary, obsessive, compulsive, very difficult child to deal with very picky eater, and has a habitual constipation. He used to go once in 10 days. He had the most extraordinarily foul smelling stool. Who was a sweet little guy. A very typical, and fluent, fluent in his speech. And as you get older, he will be classified as Asperger disorder. Autism, Asperger disorder, Brett disorder, childhood disintegrative disorder, and pervasive developmental disorder, these four have been called autistic spectrum disorder. As of next month, they are dead, replaced by one word, autism, DSM-5. So there's a lot of anxiety amongst people, oh my God, how would it work out? So a woman called Kathleen Lord, who's the goddess of autism measurement, did a beautiful study that showed, using both criteria, classification, 98%, 97% of children previously classified autism as autism are still autistic in the new classification. So nothing will happen. We will not be undercounting. So there are some people worried about DSM-5. So you can tell them confidently, don't worry about it. That's the least of our problems. Now, I personally believe a high-functioning autistic child who drives everybody crazy, plays Mozart by the ear, and is good at chess, is very different from a low-functioning microcephalic child with epilepsy. 
but everybody is being called autism. There are many autisms. The autistic children could be very different. It depends on what is wrong with the brain and what kind of disorder it is. And about 7% of autism is caused by diagnosable, nameable genetic disorders. They behave differently. Usually they are lower functioning. So I used, I picked it up from um, Dr. Suedo. People say that in autism, everybody's snowflake. It's very, very true. They are very, very different. But right now we are stuck with one word called autism. We don't have a term called the autisms. But I just put it up just to let you know they are very different. Is it a genetic disorder? Look at monozygotic twins. Monozygotic, monochorionic, monoamniotic, one sac, twins, identical. If A is autistic, the chance B is will be diagnosed to be autistic is 80%. If they are dizygotic twins, two sacs, fraternal twins, two boys, different looking boy girl, the chance that B is autistic is 30%. If it's a sibling, two years later, next child is 5%. Next door neighbor, I'm related, <laughs> one in one ten. I met her. <laughs> but take, stare at this, stare at this, please. What's up with this? This guy is a sibling. It should be five, but it's thirty percent. Why? That's the excitement. Something is up with that pregnancy. During that pregnancy, this fetus who already has genetic risk increases his chances of getting autism from 5% to 30%. So until that is resolved, there will be a lot of questions regarding that pregnancy. So it's, at, at this moment, it's unknown. But notwithstanding this problem, is it a genetic disorder or not? It is. That's how twins behave. Have you heard of triplets with autism? Three boys with autism? You know how heartbreaking it is? So usually when that happens, they are low functioning. Fascinating to see triplets with autism. This is a genetic disorder. Only thing is, it's not a single gene disorder. We haven't figured out what it is yet. Do vaccines or mercury cause autism? A lot of people think autism is caused by MMR vaccine that is given around 12 months. Anybody, have, people have heard this? Yes? Yeah. Why do you think that started? Take it. 30 to 40 percent of autistic children are normal for the first one year of life. They have already been walking, they have already been babbling and talking and saying, Mama, Dada, a few more words. Somewhere between 12 and 13 months, they stop saying newer words. Between 13 and 18 months, they lose all the existing language, they stop looking at you, they regress. So if you stop acquiring new words after 12 months, and then you regress, and you want to relate it to some event that occurred at 12 months, what would that be? Yes. Emma Marsha. <laughs> but there was a reason for it. Congenital rubella. MMR, R in MMR, causes an autism-like syndrome. But they are mentally retarded, microcephalic, with autistic features. <coughs> so the older doctors remembered the rubella cases that looked a little bit autistic. And then, because of this excitement, people got carried away. But I want to tell you something about how things happen. Right? So what extraordinary thing happened that affected public communication in 1994. You got mail. Remember the movie? Yeah. AOL. CompuServe, AOL became public access to everybody, right? The birth of the internet as we can use it. In the summer of 1995, there was a woman in Washington, D.C., who had a child diagnosed to be autistic. But when that child was 13 or 14 months, she tried to argue with the pediatric doctor, oh, look, there's no diphtheria in America. There hasn't been any whooping cough in Fairfax County. I really don't want to give all these shots. 
He did a very good job in convincing her and gave her the DPT vaccine, I mean, uh, MMR vaccine. Two months later, the child stopped talking, stopped looking at her. Within four or five months, he was very abnormal. At 18 months, he diagnosed her to be autistic. At that time, she was pregnant. When the next baby came up for shot, she begged him not to give the shot. And he was masterful in convincing her he should give the shots. Guess what happened? The second one was also diagnosed to be autistic. Oh. She was pissed. <laughs> you know what she did? Well, Sitting at her kitchen table on her computer, she created a beautiful page. It says, National Vaccine Information Network. Usually, what does that mean? National Vaccine Information Network. Government, NIH, CDC, yeah. right? She did it herself. <clears throat> Within one year, she had a million hits. When you see a story like that, when a normal child who gets shots and becomes autistic, there would be people who believe it. Within a couple of years, a lot of people began to believe MMR vaccine causes autism. And then something extraordinary happened in 1999. There was a man in England, a doctor, a surgeon, a surgical gastroenterologist, who published a paper along with 10 other authors saying that when he did endoscopy, he found measles virus in the specimens that he brought out. So in, 19, in 2000, that paper came out. It destroyed the field of immunization. Immunization rates dropped. People believe measles caused all vaccine. It took another four years before it became evident nobody in the entire world could replicate that study. <laughs> One single reporter, his name is Mr. Baird, an Englishman in London, he went after this guy. And by 2007, he was exposed as a fraud. <coughs> what he did was something very bad. <coughs> he was disbarred from the medical council in England. He was kicked out, he lost his job, and he came to America. <laughs> Where is he practicing? Yeah. Austin, Texas. Why? There are thousands of believers in him. This is what happens with public information if it's not properly controlled. Do vaccines or mercury cause autism? They don't. Autism is a genetic disorder. So what's up with mercury? How did it get in there? You know, you heard about it? I, I wanted to ask a question, but are we allowed to ask questions yet? Yes, yes. Or is that for the end? I can ask ask now. Back to um, the uh, vaccination, do they know what it is that causes the change at that time frame? Do they know what it is that causes it to rule out that it is the MMR? Incredible speculation that certain processes that are supposed to happen in the brain around that age, in the development of the brain, especially what is called synaptic physiology, the synapses that allow brain cells to talk to each other fail. Whatever system they are supposed to develop, don't. So a child does not get and loses the ability, because the rest of the brain is continuing to grow, loses the ability to reciprocate. It does not know how to imitate or mimic or appreciate the relationship between speech, facial expression, mother's face, teacher's face. But guess what? I gave you a bullshit answer. It's not really known. It's not really known. Currently, the greatest speculation is autism is a disorder of synaptic communication. And children at three months, four months, seven months are mostly brainstem animals. But somewhere around 12, when they start to speak, when they start to mimic, when they start to imitate, they are functioning at a higher level. To do that, Brain cell systems have to communicate with each other. So there is a very interesting man in England, Simon Baron Cohen. You recognize the name? His uh, cousin's name is Sasha Baron Cohen. <laughs> Did you know the comedian Sasha Baron Cohen, Borat? Yes. So they had a master's degree in mathematics. <laughs> mathematics master's degree from Oxford. One guy became a comedian, the other guy became the world's most important 
neuro, uh, neuropsychologist in autism. Single-handedly, in the last 30 years, he produced some of the best information we know. Simon Baron Cohen. If you read what he said, he is now beginning to describe that autism is a failure of the mirror neuron system. There are neurons in our brain that <coughs> teach the brain, the organism to mirror, to mimic, to imitate, to associate mother's face, lips, mouth, expression, with affection, with language, with speech. That's, that doesn't kick in. It's not proven yet, but most of what he said at last 10, 30 years turned out to be true. So we're paying attention to it. So the good answer is, I don't know. But thank you for allowing me to speculate. <laughs> Mercury. Mercury is interesting. In 1963, in Minamata Bay, right off of Tokyo, a battery manufacturer released an effluent into the ocean. You know, those days things were not very regulated. Women who ate fish, fished out of that bay, delivered children who were microcephalic, mentally retarded with autism, autistic features. You know, hand flopping, spinning around, no communication. Many people don't forget stories like that. So somebody, when they saw vaccines cause a preservative called thiamerosol, so they jumped on it. It took 10 years to decontaminate that information. Countries where thiamerosol has been removed 15 years ago are experiencing increasing in autism. So what will happen now? He will take it his vaccine. You got a low functioning autistic child, you are mad as hell, you want to <coughs> blame it on somebody, right? So you sue vaccine manufacturers, hospital pediatrician. So after seven or eight years of such litigation, the government said, no, this is not good. Vaccine manufacturers are going to run away. Something similar happened in 1977 with the now they have created what is called the vaccine court. The vaccine court has a judges that are called special masters. It's in Washington, D.C. So if you believe your child has been hurt by a vaccine, you can take this case there. And if they believe so, whether or not there is any scientific basis or an explanation, if they believe that autism, I mean, what this child is being described to be autistic, is caused by a shock. It's not easy to prove. They will give you a compensation. But you can't sue the vaccine company. Out of 5,300 cases, one case turned out to be that the special master agreed that this child was affected by the vaccine. As it turns out, that child has a mitochondrial disease. Mitochondrial disease is every time you get a fever, your bottom falls out. Most of the neurologists in the country believe it's a mitochondrial disease. However, remember, they had agreed that if it is a disorder caused by temporarily related to vaccine, they'll give the compensation. So they gave the family for $850,000. The case went away. But there has never been a case of proven vaccines causing autism. What is the developmental biology? What's going on in the brain? Pay attention to this. This is very, very important. Many people don't seem to be paying attention to this. 50% of autistics are mentally retarded. Did you know that? If you cut off the IQ score at 90 or 85, 75% of autistic children are mentally retarded. So there's a high prevalence of mental retardation in autism. But if you go to Letchworth Village, a uh, developmental center, a uh, center that keeps severely handicapped children, and look at mentally retarded individuals, 75% of mentally retarded people have microcephaly, small heads. But look at this, 35% of autistics are macrocephaly. So how could a condition that produces a high rate of mental retardation have the opposite of a condition that is supposed to occur in mentally retarded. Those of you who have seen autistic children, if you close your eyes and imagine that child, the kid has a big head. They're not big at birth. They accelerate in head growth by age one. By age two, they got off the chart. 
and A345, they run above the shark, you know, the two standard deviations above the mean. By age five or seven, it slows down, but they carry a big head. Autistic children have large head. Autistic children are normal, 35% of them, for the first one year of life. That's called autistic regression, and this is macrocephaly, large headedness. Those two things you should know. It, it will be helpful when you are in a conversation. <laughs> so, what is making this head large? What aspect of the brain tissue? So far, no one has ever found anything wrong with the neurons, or the glial cells, or the astrocyte. These are all the cells in the brain. There are not too many blood vessels. So why does the brain get large? It appears there is too much white matter. You know, the brain has gray matter, white matter. There's too much white matter. So if I have time at the end, I will give you my speculation about why there is too much white matter. So it appears that this large headedness is caused by too much white matter, which is a bunch of nerve fibers that are supposed to connect the neurons in the cortex to the rest of the body. If I have time, I'll come back to the movie. So, if you by chance have time to go to a website called Autism Truths, at the bottom there's a crawler. It goes to the right or left. The first one says, Autism in a hundred words. Simon Baron Vaughan. Do autistics have a theory of mind? Simon Baron Vaughan. The systemizing and empathizing theory. Simon Baron Vaughan. Modified checklist for autism. How can you diagnose autism in young children? Simon Baron Cohen. Mirror neuron hypothesis. Simon Baron Cohen. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. You know that book? Mm -hmm. Men think that they know maps, directions. They're arguing with the wife when they're driving, they got lost. <coughs> the women have better intuition. They actually drive better. Don't tell them that. <laughs> so, men are systemizers, women are empathizers, and he has a beautiful explanation why autism occurs because of an abnormality of testosterone influence on fetal development. Baron Cohen said the fetus is a female, is phenotypically a female. <coughs> the arrival of androgenic influences make it into a male, if it's a male. And if there is too much male, you get a hyper male. <coughs> My client cultures look like a little bit like autistics. So this is called sexual dimorphism theory. It is one of the theories explaining why 7 out of 10 are boys. Are you aware of that? Out of 10 autistic children, 7 are boys. It's not 50 50. I actually think it's 9 to 1. So mirror neurons, I only put that there to tell you that if you go to that website, it looks like somebody <coughs> built a temple for a man called Simon Baron Cohen. You know who built that website? I did. <laughs> Guess what? I never met the guy. I think he's a genius. You know where his genius was first exhibited? And I'll tell you the story in a manner in which you will never forget. Movie box in the room? Not your kind of movie, honey. You're too young. <laughs> <laughs> the Dean. Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor, Sandy Dennis, George Segal. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Yeah. Remember that scene when Burton castigates Taylor for having been a nag all his life, for having affected his professional life. Yeah, it looks like a Yale campus, right? Or one of the campuses, maybe Princeton, Yale. Yeah. And the two guests are embarrassed. The husband and wife are going after each other. She attacks him for cheating on her. He attacks her for nagging him all his life. It's considered one of the greatest movie scenes, the dialogue, the acting of Richard Burton, the beauty of Elizabeth Taylor's facial expression. Till today, it is considered a seven minute scene against which other such scenes are compared. 
So what Simon Baron Cohen did, he put 25, one after the other, autistic individuals in a chair, and he showed that eight minute scene, and rigged it in such a way, he has that great assistant, you can actually track what the viewer is looking at. So 25 autistic <coughs> and 25 neurotypical. You know what he found? All the autistic people look at Elizabeth Taylor's lips. All the non-autistic people look into her eyes. People look into people's eyes. You can't figure out people if you don't look at their eyes. So he called it theory of mind. Theory of mind. Being able to read other people's mind. Okay? Oh, uh, where is she? She gave away my age, right? In a way. And I made a joke. I forgot that I was going to do this. But I usually tell people this. For a moment, gentlemen here, forget the fact she gave away my age. How old do you think I am? other people make fun of? Okay. I'm choosing my words well. Yeah. I have the guts to use some bad language here and there. <laughs> and most of everything I said you understood. Right? And I seem like I know what I'm talking about. Right? Now you are thinking there, you are sitting there, you are thinking that this man is about 45, he looks like he's from India, for an Indian guy he speaks pretty good and he knows what he's talking about. And he's a good speaker. Think like that. <laughs> <laughs> I am thinking, you could be thinking that of me. I am thinking that you could be thinking those things of me. Artistic people don't have. It's called mind blindness. If you understood that part, you'll understand every autistic child that you run into in somebody's living room or a picnic or a birthday party, why he's having difficulty. He cannot read other people's minds. He can't figure it out. So imagine you have an IQ of 135, you play Mozart by the ear, you're a master on the computer, but you do not have concepts of jealousy, selfishness, ridicule, being made fun of, telling jokes. You don't have that. That's autism. How do you train such a child? Three. You got to find them when they are two, when they are three, not when they are nine. Every time I see a nine-year child, nine-year-old child in South Bronx, carried a speech delay, I feel like punching somebody. But who would I punch? It's a shame to our profession to carry children up to age nine a speech delay. Mr. Dean, do you know why that happens? It's a, because of a beautiful program called Early Intervention. Intervention. Intervene. Give speech therapy. Give physical therapy. Give occupational therapy. But somebody forgot to tell them, for heaven's sake, make a diagnosis. That's what's happening for the last 20 years. So if there are educators here, get involved in that. Early Intervention is a great program, but does not make diagnosis. Call it speech delay. What are the comorbidities? There are lots of problems with comorbidities. Do you know what I'm now known for? Body career, professor of clinical neurology, triple board certified, and the best haka doctor. I do bowel retraining. <laughs> Autistic children have habitual constipation. They don't go to the toilet. They are constipated. They go once in 10 days, once in 13 days. They have what is called spurious diarrhea. What is that? False diarrhea. There's a huge lump of stool in the colon. The stool that is proximal to it is putrefied. So it leaks around the lump of stool, 
comes out as diarrhea, they have the worst possible smelling stool. Nobody wants to babysit that guy. <laughs> so it looks like diarrhea, but it's not diarrhea, it's false diarrhea, it's constipation. So what do you have to do? This kid has been like this for six years. Here, yeah, remember the guy I told you, he wants a pamphlet? Mm -hmm. So you have to give a stool softener every night, and um, give a suppository in the morning. So stool softener, suppository. You get a couple of pellets. Stool softener, suppository in the morning. You get a little bit of bowel movement. Stool softener, suppository. Stool softener, no suppository. It's beginning to come down. Stool softener, but you always put the suppository at 6.55 a.m., put him on the toilet, stay with him. Now that he's been programmed to receive the softened stool coming down, and you have evacuation from below, you can retrain him. Why am I doing that? Because when he was one, he was a picky eater. She was walking around all the time feeding him. Do you know there are autistic children that entirely survive on milk at night and nuts and grapes? There are dozens of autistic children who only eat chicken McNuggets with the batter removed and french fries. Today's guy lives entirely on pizza. If she will give it to him, he will eat pizza three times a day. His entire food repertoire is two, three dishes and milk. They are very picky eaters, very difficult to feed, and then when they get a little older, they get constipated, but when they get to be eight and 10, they eat everything. They are big, they are obese. Autism is a disorder of regulation. Regulation of eating, regulation of elimination, regulation of eating again. Similarly, this disorder of regulation also does not give you sleep. Children are supposed to sleep at night. Small children are supposed to sleep 10 hours, 11 hours. Otherwise, how would you have a life? <laughs> Autistic children don't sleep. They have no concept. It's bedtime. They have a great deal of difficulty falling asleep. They get up several times at night. Sleep is a very major problem in autism. So you have to train them. You have to sometimes. How many of you have used melatonin for falling asleep? I think it's one of the most powerful drugs that I ignored all these years. My major treatment now is melatonin. Melatonin is very safe. So sleep should be dealt with. If a child sleeps better at night, he actually is a little bit better behaved during the day. The other thing with comorbidities, out of very out of every 100 children, how many are epileptic? One to two. One to two of the general population has epilepsy. Twenty percent of autistics are epileptic. Epilepsy is a major problem in autism. So. Food, gut, not eating, skinny little fellow, constipation, distended belly, always going to GI doctor, later on obesity, sleep disorders, and epilepsy. Those are the comorbidities that occupy the family's time going to the doctor. Something very extraordinary happened in the late 90s. Everybody thought, that children with autism had too many infections. First of all, it starts with, he was doing all right. He didn't look at me all the time, but he had so many ear infections, I thought he was deaf. Then we put tubes in the ear, the hearing improved. I thought he will get better. But then I realized that 18 months, he was not speaking. It was a common story. So people tend to blame the infections. There was a lot of emphasis on Repeated infection. Maybe his immune system is weak. Maybe there is autoimmune dysfunction. So about 10 years has lost thinking that it is an immune disorder. During that time, an idiot came up with a very catchy hypothesis. It's called the leaky gut theory. He thought there are toxins in the gut. Remember, throughout history, mankind has always been concerned about constipation. Constitution is a major deal for people, for the public. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. What the heck is in the apple? Not much. It makes you go to the toilet. 
And if I'm regular, I'm not regular. If you're regular, you have a good life. Regularity is so important for us. So here is children who don't have regular habit, who make the most extraordinarily foul smelling stool. They got GI problems all the time. Belly is distended. It looks miserable, right? They thought fungal infection, bacterial infection, infection, leak toxins from gut into the blood, go to the brain, damage the brain, cause autism. It's called leaky gut theory. A lot of people believe that. Bullshit. It does not, brain does not appear like that. <laughs> so is autism a brain disorder or a disorder that affects the brain? How do we treat this disorder? What's the treatment for autism? <coughs> You go on the internet, you see all of autism treatments. You know what is the biggest punishment when somebody teaches you to do this for your child with autism? Gluten-free, casein-free diet. <laughs> Very unfortunate. If you have gluten sensitivity, gluten enteropathy, or if you have milk protein sensitive, if you make, eliminate gluten and eliminate casein, you look, the child feels better but does dipshit for the autism. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are a lot of parents who are spending enormous amount of time <coughs> and killing themselves giving gluten-free, casein-free diet. You know how hard it is to manage a two and a half year old completely gluten-free, casein-free? How do you feed such a child? It's a tough challenge. But some people do that because they read on the internet. Yes, gut will get better, but it won't do anything to the autism. Macrobiotic therapy, multivitamin therapy, B6 therapy, dimethylglycine injection, some jerk in North Carolina puts you in nasin. You have to stay near that, and every day you come to get a shot. When eight shots are over, you come back home. It does nothing. <laughs> DAT, what is DAT? Dolphin assisted therapy. There's a jerk in Sarasota, Florida. It will bring you there. Eight days you have to stay there. Every morning, mother and child go swimming with the dolphins. Horseback riding therapy. Secretin therapy. IVIG. Some guys actually gave IVIG. Fifteen years into it, we have now come to appreciate none of that works. So what works? Only one man. Only one man. ABA. Applied behavioral analysis. The only method that is evidence proven that if you have two children with autism, two year old, one gets three years of ABA, the other does not, this guy is school ready at five. His autism hasn't gone away. He still won't figure out people. He still will get bullied, but he's educable. He will sit at a classroom, he will learn. ABA is key. Instead of giving ABA, the system is giving speech therapy. Autism is not a speech disorder. It's a behavior disorder. It's a communication disorder. So when you see a parent, give her a gun and some bullets. Go shoot. No, I don't want speech therapy. Please spend the same money on ABA therapy. It's the same $75 an hour. That's what I do now. Every day. All the time, I'm buying guns and bullets. Go back and shoot the lady. That's it. Otherwise, <laughs> if you don't give powerful language, they don't know how to take care of themselves. <laughs> Not a good week to talk about guns and bullets. No, no. <laughs> Some very, very, very bad things have happened in this field. If you have a low functioning autistic child, parent is so frustrated, they will go to any quack. So it's a right field for quacks. They're all over the place. So any of you going towards a public health degree? Possibly, they're around graduate students. Check out a website called quackwatch.com. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful man. Howard educated anesthesiologist. He's about 87 years old. He exposes all the bastards in our field. Pure, pure. You should also read that because it makes you aware what kind of snake oil remedies are being sold by some doctors who are calling themselves integrative medicine specialists. 
You know, doctors go to med school, they do residency, they do an allergy fellowship, they become allergists. Or they do neurosurgery residency, they become neurosurgeons. Or neurologists, right? Or have you ever heard of the Integrated Medicine Fellowship? What is that? An EMT surgeon who is no longer doing surgery because he has a license. And they're giving you holistic therapies. Oh, we have a fellowship called holistic therapy? You have to be careful with people who are giving these therapies. <coughs> now, my pet topic. You go to Google tonight, I put three words in it. Murder, suicide, autism. It will blow you away. You will never forget that one. In autism, there are several, several instances of a mother, parent, after having been frustrated, I'm talking about low-functioning autism, not those savants who play Mozart, not those guys. The low-functioning ones, the ones who go to the toilet and bring the car car and put it on the dining table. Those guys, my specialty. Mothers who have killed their own autistic child, children, and killed themselves. There are several of them. Very, very tragic stories. So, no, I took them off. Okay. So I don't know if you're aware. About uh, five and a half years ago, there's a story in the news uh, radio in the morning and came out in the newspaper a day later. Was a woman from Belgium who was calling the New York City police, saying that my daughter is in some such and such part of Manhattan. Usually, she stays in this hotel, and she hasn't been responding. <coughs> The police went and broke the door, found the child and her dead. She left a note. She had made her fifth trip to America, and the last one was for chelation therapy. Finally, apparently, they located the woman who sat next to her in this chelation clinic, and they had a conversation. And she finally understood none of these therapies work. She killed herself. A year earlier, there's a woman from England who made several trips to America. On the way back, she arrived in London, picked up her car. She was driving to Leicestershire, Leicester. Stopped on the middle of a bridge, throw the kid out and jumped. That year, there was a grand co um, grandparents couple in Utah. They had been raising an 18-year-old low-functioning autistic child. And the lady was diagnosed to have cancer. And he was already a survivor of metastatic cancer. They lived in a remote part of Utah. You know what he did? Locked the door, set the cabin on fire, and called the police and said, look, we are both going to die. I don't want to leave this child as a burden to anybody else. He has to go. Anybody recognize the name Ulysses Stabile, S-T-A-P-I-L-E? This happened in 2005 in the South Bronx. Mr. Stabile is like 270-pound guy. Six foot five, big guy. He took care of his own child, Ulysses, 12 year old, who weighed 240 pounds. 12 year old. Ulysses would eat everything paper, dog food, cat food, everything. And he was extremely aggressive. The only person who could hold him was his father. So people would watch this on the street and call ACS. ACS worker would say, Is that gentleman very tall? Yes. Is his head bald? Yes. The child is very big? Yes. Oh, sir, leave man alone. He's the only one who can take care of that child. So on this particular day, Mr. Stabile called uh, the precinct near Bronx Lebanon Hospital and said, officer, come and get me. When they went, they found Ulysses dead in the crib, in the tub. He slashed his throat. He was so big a boy, the tub was full of blood. Why? Mr. Seville was found to have end-stage renal disease, yeah. but he was not a candidate for transplant. Mm -hmm. He said, I am not going to take dialysis for the rest of my life. If I die, who will take care of him? Yeah. So he killed him. There are several such cases. Now, if I am a chief of pediatrics and I go to the floor today and I tell a 39-year-old woman, Mr. Johnson, your boy is diabetic, 9-year-old, juvenile diabetes. He'll have to take insulin for the rest of his life. Does she go home and shoot him? 
Brain tumor, cystic fibrosis, no. But there is something with low functioning autistic children. It makes you think about what is the mindset, what is the mind of the mother, what does she have? Could she not cope with it? Does she have previously undiagnosed mental illness? So now, people are beginning to appreciate what are called shadow syndrome. Here is a child with autism. In his shadow, there's a grandfather with a peculiar history. There's an uncle who's been hospitalized. There's an aunt who has obsessive compulsive disorder. We are beginning to identify in the shadow of an autistic individual um, and greater than expected prevalence of mental health disorders, especially the serious one, schizophrenia and psychosis. So why am I telling you like this? It's still not known how it works, what is the genetics of it, how does it get transmitted, it's not clear. Is there a cure? No, there is no cure. But what do you do? You have to take care of child and educate him. How do you do that? You have to have places to read. So these are good sides. One of the best sides now is autism speaks. Now, this gentleman died, this died. Now and can and ARI all merged into autism speaks. But have you ever heard of this side? Anybody in this room has experience with an autistic child? You know Dan? You see the exclamation mark? These are called Dan doctors. They pick autism now. They don't have time for genetics research, etc. Look, I have a low function child, do something for me now. These people are the ones who send hair to Great Lakes Laboratory in Wisconsin for $1,800. They will test the hair for arsenic, manganese, mercury, and lead. And they will leach the child, detoxify him. Or they will get a stool sample, look for fungus, and give antifungal therapy. Or give vitamin therapy. Or calcium free diet. Or they are saying, look, don't talk to me about science. I got a disaster at home. Do something for me. So there are damn conferences, damn national conferences, damn doctors. Watch out. You ever heard of Temple Grandin? Yes. yes. She's the poster child for autism, for Asperger's disorder. And as she's now traveling, talking more and more and more, people are beginning to notice. And she says some extraordinary things about herself, about how what she sees. And now there is tremendous interest in the public about learning about autism, understanding autism. Because at the high end, you could be autistic and be very, very productive, right? Today I was telling one of the other patients, and I took her to the internet to show the story about Michael Bully. Are there people who read, browse, invest in the stock market, read about people who make a lot of money? This guy's name is Michael Bully. Michael Bully was 38 years old. He worked for a Wall Street investment firm. Uh, do you know an extraordinary financial event occurred in our lives in 2008? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's now called the Great Recession, right? Mm -hmm. Caused by what? Uh, mortgage, mortgage crisis, mm -hmm. subprime mortgages. Mm -hmm. This guy figured out. Between 2006 and 2007, he was advising his partners, wow, watch out, it's going to break, it's going to break. And in one of the presentations with some clients, he made some very aggressive comments. And he was attacking his superiors for not listening to him, for not getting out of that market, and not betting against the market. They fired him. Michael Barry has a measured IQ of 167. He moved to California. And guess what he did? He opened his own hedge fund called Scion. He bet against the market. <laughs> By the end of 2008, he made $4.5 billion. He the most extraordinary Asperger disorder. Never had friends, was a loner, never understood people, but he knew mathematics, he knew algorithms, he understood risk, he figured out how to read 
risk, risk, that was his life. So you could be Asperger disorder, which is autism, have a high IQ, but have no tact, no skill in dealing with people, cannot read other people's mind. He lost the client, he got fired. Also, <coughs> autistic people do not, Asperger people do not have enough feeling for other people's feeling. So they say harsh things, they ignore you, etc. It's a fascinating disorder how it works. Not much is understood why Asperger's behave the way they do. Transition to adult, my favorite topic. 17 to 21, it's called transition age. Some schools get it, other schools don't get it. <coughs> Some parents don't work on it. Suddenly you got a 21 year old, no school bus. Mm -hmm. And recently there's a lot of data coming on that autistic children are highly unemployable. If they have not been prepared, if they have not been taken through vocational training. This was around the time of the uh, Bangor Olympics. The odds of a child becoming an Olympic athlete is 1 in 29,000. The odds of a child being diagnosed with autism is 1 in 10. Using this kind of stuff, Autism Speaks is trying very hard to get people to appreciate the prevalence of autism and the importance of getting diagnosed early. So in Bronx, Lebanon, what we did, we created a support group. Every Sunday night I go to Price Club, I buy juice, Danish, jelly, stuff, order coffee. In the beginning when I started I heard only two mothers, three mothers, five mothers, two mothers, one mother. If it's not one game, the same one all this game. In about two years I had 18, 15. In about six years I had 40. Now it has about 45 people come every month for two hours. We drill them about autism, medication, nights, sleep, eating, food problem, obesity, transition, masturbation, sexuality. Autistic boy, 13 year old, will rub against women. He wants to masturbate in public. How do you deal with that? How do you train the mother? All of these we do every month, first Monday of every month and 10 to 12, teaching people. Because when these children go to clinic, the clinic doesn't have enough time. Nobody does that kind of teaching in a 15 minute visit. So this is the hospital I left five months ago. And I now move to Columbia, but it's harder. It's not easy for me even to get a room. So I'm going to try. So what's new for 2010? When DSM-5 comes, there will be no more PDD, Asperger, etc. There will be only one word, autism. Yeah. There was one woman in Texas. She had an 18-month-old and a 6-month-old. She killed both of them, wondering if they were autistic, how will she care for them? So what's up with her? There was one who killed a two and a half year old, saying I cannot deal with autism. You don't do that to other people. So what I'm trying to lead you to is, this is a genetic disorder that comes in the context of psychiatric disorders and Sometimes we have, I can give you an example. I give a diagnosis, confirm the diagnosis. The lady cries a little bit. I always suspected it. But I'm glad I came to you. You were so brutally honest with me. But doctor, I want to tell you something. We have an uncle who's a professor of mathematics in South Carolina. Professor of mathematics. He comes home for every Christmas. He arrives exactly at 4 p.m. on Christmas Eve. He brings nine presents, 10 presents, 11 presents. They're all wrapped exactly the same box. The ribbon is in the corner. And he puts little labels with names of the children. And he puts them near the Christmas tree. He will have dinner, but he will never sleep in our house. He will get himself a hotel room, 
He will sleep in the hotel room, comes back in the morning when the children are opening the present, and leaves at 11.59 a.m. <laughs> what does he have? Professor of Mathematics? <laughs> That's perfect as well. But sir, we have an aunt. She had the most unbelievable obsessive compulsive disorder. Textbook case. All her life, she had no life, but she was intelligent, she was an accountant, she did her work, she had no life. Around the age of 55, she began to get better. And she said, the lady is exactly like Jack Nicholson in As Good As It Gets. <laughs> you know that movie? Yes. Who doesn't know that movie? Raise hand. That means everybody knows that movie? Yeah. Yes. You have to see that movie. Because when that movie came out, the American Psychiatric Association honored Jack Nicholson for the most extraordinary portrayal of OCD. I'm just telling this just to get you interested about movies. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not allowed to see enough movies. <laughs> So this part is over, so what I decided I was going to do is to see if they had questions. It could be a particular case or a particular thought that way I could, but I must leave. Yes, only a few minutes. So you all have cards, why don't you take a moment and write down a question for Dr. Karam, and um, this is the time to, to ask away, and as you can see, he is open to any sort of question or comment. <laughs> They get so hung up on sensory issues. They give occupational therapy. The child is not speaking. They give speech therapy. It doesn't work. The same money should be used for behavior therapy. And that's ABA. Unfortunately, there's not enough ABA instructors. So speech therapy, occupational therapy is not necessary at all? Absolutely worthless, in my opinion. Because? It's not an occupational therapy problem. You know what occupational therapy really is for? When you really think about it. If I have a stroke, I have my leg is tight, my arm is tight, my mouth is tight, right? I need occupational therapy to redo my hand. Hypotonic children, low tone children, who have developmental problems, have never been shown to improve with occupational therapy. Spastic children, tight children, spastic cerebral palsy. Oh, I worship occupational therapy for that. Physical therapy, occupational therapy. So if you have injured brain, cerebral palsy, yes, physical therapy, occupational therapy. If you have hemiplegia, occupational therapy, reopen the hand. But not for developmental disorder. So the, the other therapy, would, would the ABA. The ABA, ABA therapy would work. What would be the the ulterior method as opposed to the occupant, like instead of occupational therapy, how would the other therapy work to approve that? Uh -huh. You mean how the other it's therapy, ABA. you meant ABA? Yeah. ABA is an extraordinary therapy. ABA is called discrete trial analysis, discrete, discrete trial method. That is, to teach a child who does not even know how to greet somebody, how to sit, how to do the things he's supposed to do. The ABA therapist teaches him the same task, same process, same procedure, 115 times until he masters it. 150. So I had recently a mother said, I don't want ABA, it's too cruel. If she couldn't deal with it. But the ABA therapist, if they are good, they will make the child repeatedly do it until he masters it. Tomorrow, 110 times. Day after tomorrow, 62 times. 
Next week, eight times. Next month, two times. He will eventually master it. So each of the aberrant behaviors have to be trained using ABA method. But it's very expensive. Guess what? It's one-on-one. -on -one. How many school districts can offer one-on-one -on -one therapy? So ABA is a very, very unusual, discreet, very prescribed method. Yeah, we'll come I have out. a couple of questions from Shaito. Uh, you went over a slide with art therapy on it. What were you going to say about it? Say it again. You went over a slide with art therapy on it. Art therapy. What were you going to say about it? I usually don't talk about things I don't know much about. <laughs> <laughs> art therapy is part of that list of complementary therapies. And if a child is able to express himself through art, and it allows him to improve his memory, his ability to create things, and it gives him an hour of work, and it gives one-on-one -on -one contact with the art therapist, I believe they would all be helpful for a child with that, with that kind of uh, behavior disorder. Because in behavior disorder, therapists need to have contact. But whether specifically art therapy as in painting, building, um, pottery, whatever it is. How that would help autism, I don't know. I don't think there has ever been a formal study, 100 artistic kids, art therapy, 100 artistic therapy, no art therapy, these guys went to high school. No, there is no such thing. So in the field of complementary therapies, there's a whole lot of this. But I think, personally, song is important. Children who don't speak well, Children who stutter can sing. So using grandmother, mother, sing, sing along, watch TV, watch TV with the child. It improves communication. Mm -hmm. uh, I have another one of someone, and then I'm going to come over to that side. Is there any comorbidity to autism and psychiatric disorder? Oh, yes, yes. Do you know that in the olden days, autism was called autistic psychosis? There are some parents who will tell you, Sir, you are a good talker. You are trying to help me, educate me. But I will tell you one thing. My boy is evil. The Lord put him here to punish me. Because when he does bad things, he looks straight in my face and does them. Nobody ever says that about a mentally retarded child. There is a certain segment of autistic children who behave psychotic. They seem to know what they are doing. Very hard to keep. So you're saying ABA, ABA therapy after you reach age nine is not as effective. Same with this now you have the kid and it's nine. Do you think ABA therapy will be effective for that child? At age nine, it's not really called ABA therapy. It's basically behavior therapy. Okay. A good therapist will teach the child how to behave, will give him social skills training, will teach him how to behave in a birthday party, how to greet, how to live. It's behavior therapy, but more goal-oriented. Okay. ABA is for the younger child, two and a half, three. So for the older child, like my child is in New York City public school. Yes, she's autism, but you know, they only give the speech and the occupational therapy. The school has stuff, but I don't think they do behavior therapy one-on-one -on -one in that sense. You know what you need? A lawyer. You know why? They're spending the money on the wrong therapy. The same funds should be spent on giving you a one-on-one -on -one behavior therapist. But you know what the problem is? They won't listen to you until you get a lawyer or a gun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Demonstrate autistic like features and behaviors and not be autistic. You mean he's malingering, making it up, imitating? Not possible, I think. But I think I think the person wanted to ask a different question. In other words, can a child who's not autistic have self 
abusive behavior by himself. Yeah, there's another condition that does that. But autism, if there is one little piece of information I want to leave with you today, is mind blindness. They can't figure people out. They are blind to the mind of the other people. So even as children, they have difficulty relating, they have difficulty making friendship. They go to the other guy's birthday party, they don't realize it's his birthday party. <laughs> and you know another thing is, many autistic children don't have a lot of concept about tomorrow, next week. If you do well, next summer I'll take you to Disney World. They don't get it. You have to train, you have to train. It's tough. Okay, we have time for one more question. We have a couple of questions. What is if there is any research about divorce rates for parents? Um, about which parents? If there is any research about divorce rates for the parents, or if there is any mental health ins insurance that takes care of pa families or couples, the parents of the autistic children? I missed that. Divorce, divorce rates. rates. Fourth grade. Divorce, divorce. divorce. Parents, divorce rates. Divorce. Parents divorce. Divorce. Parents. Divorce. Parents. Divorce. Parents. Parents. Divorce. Uh, contributing to divorce. child divorce. having autism. No. Contributing no. no. to the divorce. Ah. Is any research on this board for parents and families that divorce rates are higher than divorce rates for parents? Yeah. Well, this is a two-part question, right? Yeah. So the first yeah. part is. If there's research on divorce rates and mental health insurance for I see. Okay, so, able to call it. Okay, I got it. So let's separate them. You notice when I was talking about my families, it's all women. I have, as of last count, we saw 1,760 kids with autism in that center on Grand Concourse and Bottom Road. I think the active kids are about 550. The women, the people who bring these children to the clinic, and the ones who come to our parent support group, all women. Where are the men? They run away. They can't handle an autistic form. Please look up a movie called Autistic Like Me. Autistic Like Me is made by a black man called Jones. And the featured doctor in this movie. Because he apparently heard me one of these talks attacking men, attacking <laughs> husbands, leaving women. He got upset because he raised the autistic child himself. So he found 10 other fathers between Philadelphia, New Jersey, and New York and made a documentary of fathers of autistic boys. Very interesting. It got a, a previews in Manhattan. He's looking for some more funding before he releases it. Autistic like me. You will hear me talking in that movie about how the men run away. They can't deal with it. Because men want to play catch. The men want to hang out with their boys. Men want to wrestle with their boys. The guy can't. And of course, there is blame on, it's your side of the family. You did this, you did that. Yes, it would contribute to split up. But so does other illnesses. Extremely low birth weight babies can do that too. Children with cancer could do that too. So I think divorce is a bit removed, but men do not handle autism well. My entire population is mothers, grandmothers, foster mothers, and grand aunts. I see very few men in my clinic. But this clinic is more people. Here. The other part is what kind of mental health counseling is available or sure. insurance. Is this insurance for sure. parents, families? Very difficult. First of all, Medicaid pays for only in the mental health clinic. Most insurance plans are poor on counseling and therapy, you only get so many visits. So in, in our country, mental health treatment, mental health services are poor. Physical health, they give everything. You know how angry I get when I see an autistic child being brought by the mother and she has a $2,800 MRI scan, $2,000 worth of EEG, I would like to shoot that doctor because there is nothing on the MRI that diagnoses autism. Why do they do that? They will pay for it. 
It's easy to get paid for those. $2,800 is 56 hours of ABA. Mm -hmm. Um, because of the time, we have refreshments and cookies, and, and we thank you so much for, for coming and presenting tonight.